and all the rest of the other things that they have there, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Um. So let's start off with a with a with a warm up question then. Okay. Um. Where do ideas come from? Do we make ideas, or do they come from somewhere else and then go into our heads? If they, they come from come, somewhere else, where do they come from? They come from anywhere, I think. So when I need to think of a book idea, I, normally I'm blank. My mind is completely blank. And I, um, so whenever ever I get inspiration, I try and write it down or at least remember it in a tiny little recess of my mind. So I find ideas, inspiration from films, from books, from things I've seen. Um, normally visually, I think my ideas come to me. So seeing something and thinking that could lead into something else. Um, yeah. can I just same. I think they're both the same, I think, really. So, yeah, I do get asked, where do I get my ideas from? And I get asked a lot, what's the favourite book that I've written? Yes. Which is always a hard one, isn't it? Because I can only basically remember the last one that I've written. I don't, <laughs> don't get back that far. Um, and also you feel like you're being disloyal to the other books. So yes. I think it's the first book that I've written because it's the special one that got published and you get to see in the bookshop. So that's normally my answer. The Goldfish Boy is the first one. Um, yes. But yeah, those two are the very classic questions. I think ideas, um, what car do you drive? I sometimes get asked that. Normally, okay. yeah, by year six, ask me what car yeah. do I drive. I occasionally get asked how much money do you earn? Yes. And, and I remember the first time I was asked then, a teacher immediately apologised uh, for, for for being so rude, and and I thought, and then I thought about it afterwards. I thought I don't think he was being rude. I think he just wanted to know whether this is something he can actually do for a living. Yes, he just wanted to check this was a viable profession. And what did you say, James? <laughs> um, it's not. It's not a viable profession. <laughs> no, that's the sad. <laughs> we work out the percentage of what we earn with books, and then you can see everybody's shoulders slumping. <laughs> like really you have to send yes. a lot of books to you make it lot of books. but the way I think I don't know what you feel but um if you if you want to be uh, an author and all you do is write books and then uh, somebody else does all the other stuff then that's that's it's very difficult to earn a living like that but if you're prepared to do some of the other bits in the chain you're prepared to also be the marketing person who goes around schools and events promoting your book then 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 got a little bit more of the pie haven't you yeah um, my doorbell's just going and you can do as a writer aren't you and of course you, yes. can be sure you can be a you can be a bookshop you can you can do you know you can do all the different things um, yeah but which yeah, I didn't realise I didn't realise that it was involved when I started but I thought I just wrote books and I actually thought someone else would edit them as well <laughs> well <laughs> <laughs> so hang on so let, well let's talk about that then so so you have an editor presumably the, the publisher yes. provides the editor and yes. uh, and how what most people don't meet editors what what is an editor what do they look like who are they my editor is lovely so I have an editor called Lauren and she works for my publisher at Scholastic and she is someone to bounce ideas off I talk to her about ideas I might have she has input now about now I'm with somebody we can sort of talk about um where the story might go and then I write a synopsis and then I do a chapter breakdown um so and then I go away and write it then I'm on my own so I write the first draft and then I send it to Lauren it's like handing you in your homework I don't know if you find this James and I wait for her feedback so she then writes a couple of A4 sheets of what she liked what she didn't like mm -hmm. um and then that's the hardest part of editing I think to go back then to the book and think right okay how am I going to make this mold this better and then after each stage it gets easier and easier so um but she's very good and she's a lovely editor and she will always say this is your book um at the end of the day this is just my ideas so she's never kind of forced things yeah. in the story and most of the time we're on exactly the same wavelength so that's really handy I think it's really important to have someone that you um, you're aiming for the right, the same style of book, the same kind of vibe of the book, which yes, really... if they if they get you, that's probably helpful. My yeah. my editor, I always say, is a cross between um, a teacher and a sea monster. Yes, <laughs> yes, I'm not sure about the why the sea <laughs> monster. Is she quite or are they quite scary or 
Um, well, Jim, I've had a few. I've had a few. Um, but no, Jim, no, they're, they're, everybody that works in children's publishing is lovely, aren't they? You they never are. meet anybody like, oh, I don't like them. They're always, everybody's, no. everybody's lovely. You know, they not necessarily are. competent, but they're always lovely. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I, I was interested, you said that, you, so you talk to your editor when you're coming up with the idea for the book and planning I the book. I do not- now, yes, yes. Yeah. So I think she wants to make sure that, because I write contemporary mysteries, that I'm not suddenly going to say, I'm going to write a horror set in outer space mm-hmm. or something. And she goes, oh, we didn't sign up for that. So um, I'm talking to her tomorrow, actually, about the next book I'm going to write. So I always come up with a short synopsis and then think it's wonderful. And then she always comes back and says... Yeah, not quite sure about the mystery. The mystery part of the books that I write was always the hardest. And I are, they are the bit I gloss over because oh, I'm not okay. sure what's going to happen. And she picks up on that straight away. And but like, mm, you haven't quite... I think, because the thing, if you're writing a mystery um, and so the reader doesn't know what the answer is until the end, then either you you know what the answer is when you're writing, but then you're pretending to not know it, which is quite strange. Yes. But I seem to remember having a conversation with you once about Goldfish Boy. You mm-hmm. know, you didn't know who the <laughs> kidnapper was until, until he got there. <laughs> so that so, is um, a good lesson in how not to write a mist. Well, it worked in the end, but I was halfway through the book and a character had gone missing. And even I didn't know what happened to the character. So I hadn't plotted. I hadn't done any planning. Um, I th- and it was a good way to work it out as I went along. Yeah. And then also what I did, I did have an idea what had happened to the character. And then I realised that's really obvious for the reader. So I then had a red herring because I then I changed it quickly. So that's something that I've learned along the way, how to do red herrings. Just yeah. you know. Well, maybe if, if you believe that the red, if you decide who did it, and yeah. then you write that, but then you decide, no, I'm going to change this to a red herring. Yes. Is that makes yes. that the way to do it. So it feels yes. so it's yeah. almost like um it's almost like believing your own lie. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um yeah, so I lot lo- so so I because uh, obviously some writers say, no, don't tell anybody what you're writing until you've finished. Who obviously we don't recommend anybody uh, in this audience reads any of their books or watches the films. But he wrote a wonderful book called On Writing. Have you read it? I have. That that inspired me to write. That was the the catalyst because I thought I really want to write. I don't know how to do it. And he just said, "Think of an idea and start." And I thought, "Oh, I thought I needed to know the end. I thought it needed to know everything." And that's why I started the Goldfish books. Thought, "Oh, I could just start." Fantastic, because yeah, he, he says you should write with the door closed and edit with the door open. So what I think he means by that is when you're writing, keep it to yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then when you're editing and, and changing it and improving it, that's when you let people in. Yeah. Uh, which is interesting. But you're, the process you've got with Scholastic at the moment is that you let them in from the beginning. The beginning, yeah. And then, and then shut them out for a while. Yes, yeah, exactly. And I can, we come up with an idea and then halfway through I think mm, that's not really working. And then I will sort of tweak it. And sometimes I say to Lauren, I'm trying to think when this has happened, but it has happened in previous books. If it's something really big, hmm. um, then I will say to her, this is how I think it's going. And she's always, yeah, okay, let, write it and let's see. <laughs> so she's kind of, you know, she could easily say, oh no, that didn't work at all. So yeah yeah it's um and do because i kind of i've only recently started doing chapter um plotting so Mm. chapter one this happens chapter two and i really really don't like doing it at all it feels like it takes the fun out of writing but then Mm. when i'm writing you i do right what's going to happen now and then i find halfway through it kind of fizzles out because i've changed things too much and then the chapter doesn't make sense anymore yes well i suppose it's there's a difference between having a plan and then changing that plan to not having a plan, isn't there? There's yes. a difference between those two things. A bit like yeah. you, you go for a walk, you look at the map, you say, we'll go this way. But then halfway through the walk, you go, actually, let's go that way. That looks that, nicer. Yeah. You know, that, yeah. That's different from going, let's just walk in random directions and see where we go. <laughs> um, you know, they're both, I mean, you can do that, but it's, it's, a different, it's a different thing, isn't it? Um, yeah. I, I, I wonder, because obviously a lot of the children watching this at school, um, I mean, one, one of, I don't know about you, but I love visiting primary schools. And my main reason I love it is because children are also writers. Um, most grown-ups 
they don't do any writing, so I don't know what to talk to them about. There's only people like you who are grown ups who, who also write that I, I have anything in common with. Uh, but, but children, they're doing it all day, all the time. They have to write stories. It's part of their job, whether they think that's... Um, children yeah, so, have to write. so the thing I love about going into primary schools is that children are also writers. They do writing all the time. Um, and, and I do writing workshops as well. Um, I, I used to do lots of them. I do a few these days. Um, and I wrote a book called Write Your Own Funny Stories, which takes you through the whole process of coming up with an idea for a story, planning the story, doing more planning around the story, and then looking at the shape of the story, and then writing the story, and then editing the story. That's the whole process. And um, But the more experience I have of, of working with children on their writing through the workshops that I do, and the more I write, and the older I get, um, I think I'm veering to the other way now. I think I'm thinking, no, don't plan anything. Just write. Just enjoy right. yourself. Yeah. And I do wonder, because obviously with school writing, um, it's not just about doing writing. You, you no. need to be doing something that can be measured. Yes. Uh, because that's the way our school system works at the moment. You can't just go off and sit and write a story and don't tell anything about it. You've got to have something that can be measured and graded and so that so the government have got something to beat up teachers over. And yeah. um, so maybe this whole concept of you've got to plan the story and all that, because that's something that can be easily measured, isn't it? Yes. Uh, yeah. Whereas the, if, if the whole question is how good is this story, it's a really difficult thing to grade, isn't it? But yeah. did you do your mind map? Yes. Did you do your story mountain? Did you do your chapter by chapter planning, etc.? So is there so 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 you're you're doing the chapter chapter planning at the moment. You're doing it in the in the primary school way. You're doing kind of the bare minimum that I can get away with, to sure. be honest. And also, I think because I'm writing to a deadline, if I don't, I can spend a, you know, forever going off in the wrong direction. And then I think that there's a danger of that happening. I haven't actually mm. done it. But, um, but you're right. I think the more planning and the more mapping and the more the more you take out the excitement, that initial excitement of an idea... Yeah, and you're diluting it by doing all those things, aren't you? And then when you sit down to actually write it, like, this is you know, I feel like I know the story too well. Or yes, well. sometimes I overshare what I'm writing. I'll tell yeah, my yeah. other half, and I'll usually tell my chill, my daughter. I'll tell her what I'm writing. And I'll read her bits. Mm. Then if I start, maybe if I'm doing it, if I'm in a school, if I start reading bits out of my notebook, if I do too much, I mean, I, I like doing that occasionally, mm. but if I do it too much, I feel like I've already done the job yeah. i've already shared the story because yeah. that's what we're doing isn't it we're creating and then we're sharing it so if yeah. you overshare too soon that's really you know, true. you've already you've already done it haven't you yeah you know, so maybe yeah. children who are, who are watching this at, at school with you know maybe it's uh some yeah maybe, maybe have a think about it i always think you should have two types of writing that you do there's the writing you do for school which is so important really important do all that stuff do all the spag and the spam and the spaghetti and the whatever it is do all that but then also have your own secret notebook and write whatever you want in yeah. that whenever yeah. you want and don't, don't worry about that. the spelling or the punctuation or the grammar don't worry about any of that yes yeah yeah I, make, I, make up words that's what yes. I do. <laughs> yeah. when you're writing lisa thompson um, do you tend to use a pen or a pencil or do you go straight onto uh, digital? What's straight process? onto laptop. So I write on a laptop. I really don't like, for some reason, I don't like handwriting anything. I Just book wise, I don't mean I don't write anything. That's how. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I'm right on my laptop. So even notes and things like that, I tend to write down. The synopsis goes onto the laptop. Um, I then use a package called Scrivener which is um, something I've only recently been using the last couple of years. And it's for authors and I think playwrights as well use it. And you kind of set out your chapters and you can see them. And then once I've got the first draft on there, then I go on to Word and I write it just as a long Word document. Um, so I just find handwriting. I don't know why. The only time I ever do write by hand is... Um, there's a thing called Morning Pages. Have you heard of that? Yeah. I can't remember what, for, what book it's from. And I, so blank, completely, what's well, that? Like free writing. It's something that some of the viewers might like to have a try. Completely blank your mind, have a pen, piece of paper, and just write anything, anything at all. And it's surprising how much you could actually write. So that's the only time I ever kind of use a pen and paper and do, do writing that way. 
but I much prefer a laptop. How about you? Do you are you a digital? I, I do a mixture. I tend to start by using a notebook and pen, um, and then I'll type it up. But I won't write. I'll usually write the first few chapters with a pen, and then I'll oh, type that up. And then, and then usually, I'll somehow find myself. I just seem to have carried on writing on the computer. Right. Okay. And yeah. uh, but then if I yeah if it gets difficult, I go back to pen, notebook. Uh, yeah. If I'm trying to solve problems, um, I have but, heard that connection between your brain and the pen and the paper is there's hmm. a connection there. Isn't there? I don't know what it is, but I I don't seem to have it. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I would imagine that people are different from one another. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, I know some some children. I mean, when when you're little, the problem of is often your your handwriting, isn't it? You can write the best yeah. story in the world, but then nobody can read it. No. Um, so sometimes yeah. it's better to to write on some sort of device. I had a typewriter when I was little, um, which yeah. I, if, for for people who don't know what that is, is like a sort of medieval laptop, um, <laughs> and that was great because I could make um, I could I, I could make things that people could actually read, and they're incredibly loud and annoying for everybody else. Yeah, yeah. I love my typewriter. I think another thing for for children that I struggle with is writing something by hand and then having to edit it so writing it all out again I think I would struggle with that and I know editing I meet lots of students who don't like editing and I think it's probably because of that reason because I've got to yeah you know, well we hate editing yeah. because we've done it it's finished yeah. now we'll it's finished. Move on to the next thing yeah, yeah why would we do that well, well, what, well, I suppose the reason we do it is because it makes our writing better, isn't it? Makes it better. Yeah. yeah. It's still yeah. a pain. Nobody likes it. Nobody likes it. Um, what's have you got any books you'd like to talk about today? What's your, who's who's your your, uh, your 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 new baby? So my new baby. Well, the Treasure Hunters is out at the moment, which um, came out last year. So that's kind of based on. So I don't, I'm a mystery writer, and this is inspired by the film The Goonies and Indiana Jones. So it's a good old fashioned treasure hunt. Four kids have to go on an outdoor pursuits trip for a weekend. They don't like each other. They don't want to go. It's obviously pouring with rain. It's a bit like the Duke of Edinburgh Award. Yes. And that, but that was my inspiration. My daughter did the bronze Duke, Duke of Edinburgh Award and I picked her up and she sobbed all the way home in the car. <laughs> So we got lost and this so and so was moaning and I've got blisters and and um I was like, oh, this will be a good story. And then, um, <laughs> <laughs> I was obviously very sympathetic, but she went on to do the silver award. I think she was just exhausted. And but then coming out soon in April, I have this one. So this is the mystery of the forever weekend Ooh. about um a boy who is trapped in the same day. So if you know the film Groundhog Day. It's kind of loosely based on that. So a boy who doesn't really want to go to school and he wishes Monday would never arrive and then he's trapped in the same Sunday over and over. Oh, so, um, yeah, you can see there's pizzas, there's a dog in there, there's my main character, Corey. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a new one, but that doesn't come out until April, but early April. Well, that's not long at all, is it? No, well, well, no, good luck with that. I shall, I shall get me a copy. Wonderful. Um, and uh, would you like to give us a reading from uh, any of your books? Yes, I could read a little bit of, I'll read a little bit of The Treasure Hunters. Yes, um, please. So I will quickly tell you, my group of four characters really don't want to go on this trip. And they, but halfway through, there's a twist. I love stories with twists. And one of the characters knows or believes there's some hidden pirate treasure in a mountain. So they kind of go off on a different direction. So I shall just find the page. <laughs> Bear with me. My, um... Don't worry, I'll edit this bit out. <laughs> <laughs> right, so they've just got to beside this huge mountain called Fortune Mountain. And they've, yeah, they're kind of, it's quite a chunk of, of a way into the book, but this is just a flavor of how, how they're kind of getting on really. So here we are, said Lena, slightly breathless, Fortune Mountain. In front of us was the steep rock face of the almighty mountain. Now we were closer, I could see even more colours amongst the shades of green and brown, and a steep pathway snaked its way up the side, disappearing behind some trees. Is it me, or is it like it's alive? said Josh. He immediately flushed, probably thinking it sounded odd, but I knew exactly what he meant. It's like a giant, I said. 
silently watching and waiting for something to happen, whispered Scarlet. I shivered. The wind began to pick up and behind us the clouds were a dark purpley grey. There was a low rumble of thunder, the kind that makes your ribs feel like they are vibrating in your chest. Let's get moving, said Lena. We followed her as she made her way between the boulders. The wind was getting much stronger now and she struggled to read the map as it flapped around in front of her face. It began to spit with rain and I pulled up my hood. A flash of lightning lit up the ground around us, followed by a huge crack of thunder. Shouldn't we take shelter, I said, but Lena carried on and it wasn't long before we were walking in a deluge. It poured off my hood and in front of my face like a waterfall. Josh was beside me. I really don't think we should be walking in this, do you? I yelled at him. It was hard to be heard above the wind, rain and rumbles, rumbles of thunder. He nodded and pointed towards some boulders which leaned against each other and had a narrow groove in between them. We could hide in the gap to shelter. Scarlet followed and Josh ran up to Lena to tell her to turn back and join us. Inside the crevice, it was cold and dark, but at least it was dry. I took my hood down. Josh dived in beside us, but Lena hovered by the entrance. We need to keep going, she said. Let's just wait here until the worst of it passes. Lena hesitated, but then there was a mighty crack of lightning and a rumble of thunder and she hurried into the gap. We can't wait too long. It'll be, we'll be behind schedule, she said. We rummaged in our bags to find something to eat and drink and I stared out at the ground and sipped on my water. Another great flash of lightning lit up the path and in that brief second, I saw something. There was a figure standing on the other side of the path. There's someone out there, I gasped. Lena squeezed beside me. Where? she said. I pointed. There, there was someone standing right there. We peered into the gloom. It's the pirate ghost, said Scarlet. Another flash lit the sky and I recoiled, but this time the path was empty. Whatever I'd seen had gone. There's no one there. You must have imagined it. I didn't. There was a man standing right there. Well, I think it was a man. I only saw their back. They were looking towards the mountain. It's the pirate warning us to stay away from his treasure. Arr, said Josh. And then he did a silly moaning noise. Stop it, Josh. I'm being serious. Does anyone know about the treasure? I asked. Maybe someone is trying to else. Maybe someone else is trying to find it as well. Lena shook her head. The rain is easing off. We need to get moving again, she said. But what about the figure? Maybe we should wait for a bit just to make sure they've gone. There was no one there, Vincent, said Lena. Come on, we can't afford to take too long. Scarlet pushed past me. Let's just get on with it. Come on. We headed out of our shelter and back to the path. I'd definitely seen someone, hadn't I? I checked up ahead and then looked in the direction that we'd just come from, but there was no one there. Maybe it had just been a trick of the light. Come on, Vincent, called Josh. Stop worrying. I sighed and began to follow them as more thunder rumbled in the distance. Oh, Lisa Thompson, thank you so much. Thank um, you. I must get myself a copy of that, but what's it called again? It's called The Treasure Hunters. The Treasure Hunters. And what's the new book called? And the new book is called, which I haven't actually read anything from yet. So this is The Mystery of the Forever Weekend. So this mm. is the Groundhog Day one. So... Yes, there we are. Fantastic. Well, I'm, I'm sure people can pre-order that, but it comes out in April, um, yes. but you can pre-order it now. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us for our World Book Day digital extravaganza. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the day and uh, good luck with all the rest of your books. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.